they could return to England and set their people free with what they were learning. And Holland was the place for that. Uh, there was a town called Leiden where they regrouped for 12 years as a congregation. In Leiden, I met with one of my good friends and the president of the World History Institute, Dr. Marshall Foster. What was life like for them once they got here? It was tough. Uh, they couldn't get jobs because they weren't parts of the guilds. They had to put their children to work many times just to eat and to survive. Then they had to get their wives and children over because the king had kept them behind. And by the time they settled into Leiden in, in uh, 1609, they were, uh, they were barely surviving. But you know what? They were free. And it was the only place they could have gone in all the world that was not under a tyrant who would kill them. If they went to France, tens of thousands were dying. If they would have gone over to uh, Germany, millions were dying in the streets. If they went up to Scotland, 40,000 or more were dying. Even ministers by the thousands were being persecuted and butchered. And so of all the places in the world that they could have gone that year, that was the one place they could be free and they could worship God and they could prepare themselves for the future. Equally important to them was their love of their England that they left behind. It was under the divine right tyrant, King James, and they wanted to bring them the liberty of the gospel. And so they set up a printing press in William Brewster's home. And that press was the internet of the day. It was the way to go around the censorship of the king and to get the truth of the gospel to the people of England and Scotland. And so they produced over 15 books and then put them in kegs and sent them in ships secretly over to England and Scotland. And it went all over the country. Well, James was really excited about that. In fact, he spent the next year and a half tracking this down, and finally he found out that it was the Pilgrim Press in Leiden that had published these books. The troops came in, broke down the printing press, and took the seal of the King of England and sealed the home so no one could live there. And that was the end of their adventure in printing. And Bradford tells us, he said, they came to propagate the gospel of Christ or the kingdom of Christ to the remotest parts of the world. Yea, they could be but stepping stones for the promotion of so great a work. Now here's a vision. Here's a group of people who are losers. They escape. They now are having to leave. They've got no support. They've got no money. They have all kinds of problems. And yet they're willing to escape to a wilderness. And yet they've got this vision, a generational vision, that they can lay their lives down in this wilderness and literally put their faces down in the mud and have their children walk on their back to a better day. That's a generational perspective. In fact, it was so true of them that at the end of Bradford's life, he says that this one small light that we have kindled here in Plymouth has shined to our entire nation. So it happened. 400 years later, the liberty that the world now enjoys is because these people had the faith to lay their lives down in the wilderness 400 years ago. They had to put their children to work many times just to eat. They were barely surviving. The troops came in, broke down the printing press. They came to propagate the gospel of Christ to the remotest parts of the world. So they don't go from Holland to America. They go from Holland back to England, back into the lion's den. And that's where they hire two ships, the Mayflower, but also the Speedwell. And that's the two ships that were going to take these 150 passengers across the ocean to the New World. A little while into their trip, the speed well sprung a leak. It, it wasn't speedy and it wasn't well. It cracked and they had to pull back into shore. Another opportunity for them to get caught and imprisoned or killed. So 
Think of all the doors that have slammed on them up to this point, right? They're meeting in secret. They escape for the first time. They get caught, thrown into prison. They escape a second time, get separated from their wives and children. They try to make it in Holland. That's not working out. So they get on a ship, go back to England. The first ship springs a leak. They've got to go back again. At what point do you say, enough? We get it. This is not part of the plan. And then there wasn't enough room for all of the passengers on the remaining Mayflower. They hold a meeting and they realize that this family of pilgrims that had been together for 12 years under the loving leadership of their pastor, John Robinson, and they decide that half of them will continue the trip and half of them will stay. Can you imagine what, what it would have felt like for this pastor who had poured his life into these people and taught them everything he knew he told them the stories of all of the heroes of freedom and liberty that had come before them, starting with Moses, leading the, the children of Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land and starting a brand new nation under God's laws, electing leaders for themselves, men of character, and submitting themselves to the laws and principles that were right and true in the eyes of God. Now, Pastor Robinson would have to stay behind knowing that he would most likely never see half of his family ever again, trusting that what he had taught them, the seeds that he had planted in their hearts and their mind would bear fruit in a land that he would never visit for the sake of their children and their grandchildren while he stayed behind and helped those who were trying to survive in Holland. That's a different kind of Christian. Someone who plants seeds today, not for their own benefit, but to provide opportunity and blessing and prosperity for their children and their children's children. And they're willing to sacrifice everything now in order to give that gift to them because they know that they can ultimately stand on the promises of God and be victorious. So they, they come together, they pour everything into this, just like they did when they left England. They sold everything they had, and they had to even go in debt to get this ship, just to hire it. It's called the Mayflower. It's a, it's a former wine ship. It, it had never crossed the Atlantic. Very few ships had ever crossed the Atlantic. In fact, it was just to go around the ports of England delivering wine. And this time, they've got 102 passengers. They've got about 30 crew members and they take off late. I mean, nobody travels in September, October, November on the North Atlantic in the 16th century. You're crazy, but they did. And as they took off in the fall of 1620, not knowing that their three-week journey was going to be a eight-week journey that was gonna take 66 days. So what, what was it like on the boat? Uh, well, if you can imagine constant gales in the North Atlantic on a little boat like this, and having a boat with with no, nothing to protect the water from going down underneath. So in that one deck that is below the main upper deck, you basically have it four, four and a half feet high. You've got 102 people crammed in there. They're going back and forth at a 45 degree angle. They're all huddled together. Water is pouring down on their head. So they're constantly wet. They're barfing. Their children are barfing. They've got constant sickness and disease. They've got everybody going to the bathroom and trying to hide the smell. I mean, it, it must have been horrendous. They had no idea where they were. The ship was almost out of control. They find themselves with a ship that is now breaking. 
the main beam that holds the whole ship together, which goes horizontal, has now cracked and is coming down, and the water's pouring in. At that point, the captain comes down and says, well, prepare to meet your God. This is it. And the pilgrims had brought, providentially, a giant screw, which was a, one of those screws probably that holds the bottom of a house together when you're lifting it up. And so they pushed it just right into place at the right place, put a log underneath it, twisted it in and saved the main beam, which of course saved the ship, which saved them from disaster. What kind of person you have to be, what kind of father you have to be to look your wife and your kids in the eyes and say, we're gonna get on this kind of a boat. I know it's never crossed the Atlantic. Uh, I know this doesn't look possible, but we're gonna go because, because it's worth it. I mean, what, what kind of character do you have to have to do something like that with your family? I mean, you're either crazy or you've got courage and you've got faith. These are the real people that founded America. And they were real. Were they perfect? No. Did they cry out and scream, I'm sure, in fear? Did they, uh, were they afraid? Yes, they were, but, but they carried on and persevered. In fact, William Bradford, their governor said, if we are to lose our lives in this endeavor, at least we know that our cause is just and our cause is honorable. So their perspective was do the right thing over the long haul and in the long run, God will bless it. This could have been the most tragic mistake that they had ever made, but they didn't believe that. They continued to believe that God was with them that the wind of providence was behind their back and that nothing happens by accident. But because of this desperate situation, with no civil order to speak of, to walk into, they had to create a system by which they could all get along so that they didn't kill each other. Because remember, you had not only the pilgrims on the ship, you had other crew members you had businessmen, and everyone had competing ideas and agendas, and so they had to draft up something of an agreement that says, guys, we need to help each other. We need to clearly set out who we are and why we are here and agree on some rules that we're going to live by. And they made that covenant with God and with one another in a document that is now known as the Mayflower Compact. And they did this while they were still on the boat. So I met with Dr. Paul Jaley, the president of the Plymouth Rock Foundation, to help me understand the real significance of the Mayflower Compact. They come into agreement, saint and stranger, those from the Church of England, those from the separatists, they join together in a civil body politic, which is of course larger than any one church. It's gonna have to serve everyone. This was an act of self-government. This was not an act from somebody else telling you who your government was. In fact, they had this phrase, this would be as sure as any patent. In fact, maybe even more sure. In other words, because we did it from our own hearts. Right. And you think about it this way. If you have a say in the laws, are you gonna be more apt to be submissive to it? Sure, of course. Sure. And you, you can voluntarily consent. So that's why, that's why I would think Bradford probably meant, look, it's gonna be even more sure than a patent when we do it ourselves. Right. Because it's coming out of the convictions of our own heart, exactly. and everyone gets a say in this. It's not just the king and the top down. Exactly. I mean, think about it. Everything that America would become famous for and would make it unique among any other nation in the world was planted into the hearts and minds of those pilgrims by their pastor, John Robinson. Here you had the seeds of the richest, freest, most prosperous nation floating in the belly of this boat, crossing the Atlantic, ready to be planted in this virgin soil for the birth of the United States of America. Unbelievable. This is the uh, memorial stone erected by Massachusetts honoring the fact that the pilgrims signed that Mayflower Compact on board the ship on the reverse is the actual text of the compact. Come over and see it. What just stands out in this whole thing to me is right in the beginning where it says, having undertaken for the glory of God 
and advancement of the Christian faith. This is why we came. That's right. For the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And this is a government civil charter that they're signing. They understood that throughout history, God has always used a small group of people who were totally committed and all in. And they knew that if they kept their covenant with God and with one another, God would be faithful. This was the great experiment. The stakes were high, and they had everything to lose if it didn't work. But finding Plymouth was just the beginning, because now their work really began. They had no place. There's no place to sleep, no sleeping bags. Imagine two or three feet of snow on the ground in November, December, January. Fortunately, the captain stayed behind. He was going to leave them but he realized that if he left them, they were goners. So he stayed behind a mile offshore, and the women and children would go out every night and sleep on the Mayflower. The men would stay just sleeping on the ground until they could build some form of shelter, both from the elements and also from what they thought were hostile Native Americans who could take them down any time. But as the winter went on, it got harder and harder. They got so sick that at one time, only six or seven could walk. And you've got 102 people sick lying either inside this little fort that they're trying to build or on the Mayflower. And six or seven are changing their clothes. They're dying. They're vomiting. They're changing and, and trying to keep them warm. In the midst of that, those six or seven had to carry them up on the hill. And they would then bury them in a common grave. Why? Because they were afraid that the Native Americans would see how weak they are if they put headstones and buried them individually, they'd realize one by two, 30, 40, 50 people dying. So by the end of winter, within three months, 47 of 102 of them are dead. But the women were getting sick and dying, and they were sleeping on their children to keep them warm. So by the end of the winter, most of the women had died. Most of the children survived. They get to the end of the winter, the end of March. What would you do? You know that you're, you can barely walk. Half of you are dead. The only hope you have of surviving is going to take off right now. And the captain comes and pleads with you one more time, get on the boat. We can be in England in a few weeks. Not one of them went back. Every one of them stayed, believing that they had come for a great cause and purpose, and that if they were to die in the wilderness, they would die in the wilderness. And they stayed. Forty-seven of 102 of them are dead. They were sleeping on their children to keep them warm. So by the end of the winter, most of the women had died. Most of the children survived. through my mind was what I learned in school. Uh, didn't the white man come over from Europe and abuse the Indians? Didn't white men simply steal their land and ultimately throw them on reservations? Wasn't this a bad thing? Well, what I learned is, yes, that was happening. And there was abuse going on uh, both directions. You had conquistadors and you had these uh, opportunistic businessmen who were coming over and would stop at nothing to rape and pillage the land in order to get what they wanted for themselves. But the pilgrims were not part of that. They were totally different. Remember, the pilgrims came across the Atlantic with their wives and their children. They came as families. They weren't looking for a fight. They weren't looking to rape and steal. They came to start a new life and to bring blessing to this land and eventually to the whole world. Now, the Pilgrims' relationship with the natives was not perfect. 
uh, some things went wrong. But what stands out is the character of these people. At a time when most people in the world viewed the Native Americans as animals, the pilgrims treated them as equals. There is one story that Bradford tells us in his journal of the pilgrims executing one of their own people based on the testimony of two Native American witnesses. Who, who does that? Where do you get that from? That is a system